Today is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023, and I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 30. And this is the chapter of Isaiah that has some end times prophecy that has come true in many of our lifetimes. Growing up, everybody knew that the sun was yellow, and today the sun isn't even yellow anymore. The sun burns white hot. And these days in the media, I see all sorts of conversations in the media going on about, oh, we need, it's time we start doing things to combat climate change. Have you, have you guys seen that? All the stuff in the media that's like, it's time we start thinking about geoengineering. And it's like, uh, yeah, they've been spraying the skies for the past decade, past two decades, they've been amping up how much they've been spraying in the skies. So, of course, in the media, they're going to say, hmm, maybe we should start having conversations about maybe doing this thing that we've already been doing for 20 years. It's just ridiculous. And I think it is because of my global warming is just end times prophecy. We don't live on a globe. And the sun is like a spotlight. It's the light that rules the day. And end times prophecy, as we will see here, says that the sun is going to get brighter. And also, it's gotten hotter in the process. That makes sense. The moon is also brighter. And the interesting thing about that is, back in the days, in the 90s, I remember the moon was smudgier looking and gray looking. Now it's so bright. The moon is so bright now. It looks like the sun. That's one thing that people are going to get deceived on, though, is people will be like, well, the moon isn't shining like the sun because it's not daylight out in at nighttime. But daylight and sunlight are two different things. Go read Genesis 1. God speaks light into existence before he creates the sun. And daylight and sunlight are two different things. Daylight is just the firmament, the, the upper layers of the air, atmosphere, whatever you want to call it. I don't really have a huge problem calling it atmosphere because I think that the firmament is domed. So it's like half of a sphere. Anyways, daylight is when the actual skies are lighting up, and then the sunlight is a giant spotlight. This is something that you can research too. If you want, if you want to do accurate photography, if you want lighting, and you want it to look like natural outdoor lighting, you don't just blast a big spotlight on somebody. The, there's two aspects of lighting up the daytime, and that's the whole sky itself lights up of its own accord. And then you have the spotlight sun. Anyways, this is a lot of rambling. Uh, but I think I've mostly said everything that I had to say. The It's undeniable that the sun is hotter than it used to be. Somebody just left a comment about how now the that spotlight quality of the sun is so apparent today. And it didn't used to be like that. We used to be able to play outside all the time in the sun. I grew up in Southern California where it was really hot and we played outside all the time. Now when you go out in the sun, you feel drained. It just drains the energy from you and it's like, where am I? I'm, am I in the Sahara or something? Just being here in Oregon in the summer, it feels like the sun is the in the Sahara or something. And another phenomenon too that proves that the sun is hotter and brighter than it used to be is how it'll be a sunny day and you'll be enjoying that warm sunshine and then the sun dips behind a cloud and you instantly feel a temperature drop of like, I don't even know, 20 degrees. It, it feels like such a huge temperature drop now when the sun dips behind a cloud. You go from feeling so hot, like, oh man, I'm in a sweat, to feeling frigid and cold just because the sun dips behind a cloud. And it didn't used to be like that. Sure, you used to feel a temperature shift if the sun dipped behind a cloud, but now it's just so much more extreme. You can leave a comment if you know what I'm talking about. Um, Yeah, chemtrails. There's still chemtrail deniers out there. I don't understand. I mean, I, I should have put some pictures. They've been spraying so ridiculous where I live. But it's one of those things where there's thousands of people out there that post video and uh, photo evidence of chemtrails, but people will still deny it. They'll still not believe it. Because they just don't, a lot of people just don't go outside anymore and they don't want to go there. If, if the government could be lying about that, that's like too much for them to handle. Well, what else are they lying about? They're, they won't even allow themselves to go there. And so they will just 
convince themselves, oh, I guess planes always left smears in the sky that eventually made the whole sky gray. I guess they convinced themselves of that. Okay, Isaiah chapter 30, let's get to it. I'm just going to read this and I'll, I'll make great emphasis when we get to the relevant verse. Isaiah chapter 30. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and, tr and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. This is one of my favorite things, uh, themes that occurs in the Bible, trusting in the shadow of Egypt is just a metaphor that connects. I connect with so much. And that's how it's just the same spirit where today people have more faith in, let's say, the medical establishment than they do in God to create bodies that heal ourselves. That's trusting in the shadow of Egypt. When people, when people think that they need to go to the doctor for just a cold or a sprained ankle because they don't trust God's ability to heal and to, to give us a body that heals, people have faith in the wrong places today. And I just see that so much. People, people only trust in the shadow. Uh, and I love how it's called the shadow of Egypt because it's just an illusion. There's no substance to it. It's, they, they trust in, in the shadow of something. I just connect with that so much. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be an elp nor profit, but a shame, and also a reproach. The burden of the beasts of the south, into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses, and their treasures upon the bunches of camels, to a people that shall not profit them. For the Egyptians shall help in vain, and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. That's a really interesting verse too, and one that people have brought up in the comments before. How there are a lot of people today, I think it gets brought up sometimes with like the Jews of today, how... One of their strengths is just in sitting still, in hatching these huge, elaborate plans that take decades to unfold, and then just sitting sitting still and, and watching their plan unfold. Um, people have brought this up with like Eastern meditation stuff, how these these gurus say that they're better than other people just because, hey, look, I held my hand up in the air for 13 years or something. I sat under this tree for 20 years. And... Uh, it's just vanity. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come and forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to seize from before us. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, Because ye despise this word, and trust in oppression and perverseness, and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it assured to take fire from the hearth, or to take water without out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall you be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall, your, shall be your strength, and ye would not. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall ye flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and as an ensign on an hill. Okay, so interesting uh, verses going on here. People not trusting in God to protect them, and yet just running away. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. 
He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. This is very interesting verse here, and it is a fact of this place that the Lord does give us the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, and we're not better than Jesus, and Jesus came to earth and was treated very badly and killed, and we're no better than, than he. <clears throat> and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. Ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver, and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. I like that, that use of the menstruous cloth too, just very uh, appropriate to the, the type of reaction that we will have to graven images. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground withal and bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy, thy cattle feed in large pastures. So I'm kind of posing a question. Christ is, when stuff like this comes up, I'm just thinking Christ's thousand year reign. It seems like there's going to be life on earth similar to how life is supposed to live, and not necessarily feeling angelic like it not necessarily feeling like heaven and new jerusalem anyways if anybody has researched a lot about the thousand year reign of christ that'd be really interesting because it's just a topic i don't really know much about but every once in a while i'm reading the bible and i'm like wait a minute is this describing when christ is reigning on on earth and all of that aspect of the bible is very mysterious to me and when satan gets let loose for a little season Man, talk about things that are so interesting and intriguing, but there's just not that much information about it in the Bible. And, uh, I mean, I think God leaves certain things up for surprises on, on purpose. Who doesn't like a good surprise? Okay. Uh, so, where was I reading? Then shall he give, I already read that one, I think. The oxen likewise and young asses that ear the ground shall eat clean provender, which hath been winnowed with the shovel and with the fan. Winnowing, this this has to do with separating the wheat from the chaff. Winnowing with the shovel and with the fan. Winnowing is when you take, you're separating the wheat, the, the part of the grain, the wheat plant that we actually eat from the, the stuff that flies away. They, they take the the wheat and throw it up in the air and the lighter stuff gets carried away by the wind and then the the wheat that you want falls back down to the ground anyways this was something that i was just researching yesterday and it's really really a fascinating thing to research winnowing and there is it called uh i forget the name for it but there's a word for where a certain look-alike plant will become more like the crop that people are trying to harvest. So when people are harvesting wheat, I think it's rye and something else actually began as, as a, a weed of wheat. I'm pretty sure about rye, so I'll just keep talking about it in this context. So rye actually started out as a weed, but as humans were harvesting wheat, they were pulling out all the rye weeds, but in in that way, pulling out the rye weeds, or they were using winnowing to get rid of rye, the, the weeds, but in that way, it made like a selection process. They were selecting rye plants that were more wheat-like by doing this. By trying to get rid of all the rye, it, it actually ends up selecting, making the rye become more wheat-like until it just becomes so similar to wheat that it's hard to distinguish the two. Anyways, just a really interesting biology topic to study. There, evolution is BS, but plants do have the ability to adapt, and plants can become like other plants, lookalikes. 
And this happens with animals too. You'll get certain mimicry that happens for different reasons. But this is a very interesting type of mimicry that happens up, that happens from humans uh, domesticating crops. You get these like the wheat and the tares things. Certain weeds will start to imitate the crop that you're harvesting. And uh, yeah, so that's obviously very important biblically, the concept of wheat in the tares. And I suggest you go look up winnowing is really interesting. And it, yeah, there I'll have to post a link to this type of selection process that makes weeds become more like the plant that is being harvested. Okay, and, uh, and there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Interesting. Okay, here, this video turned out to have a lot of side topics, but this is it. Verse 30. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. So this is end times prophecy that has been fulfilled by today. The moon really does shine like the sun. No, during nighttime, it doesn't look like daytime, but that's because daylight and sunlight are two separate phenomenons. Uh, but the moon is so bright. Go out on a full moon. This is why they talk about supermoons now. 20 years ago, nobody knew what a supermoon was. 30 years ago, whatever, nobody knew what a supermoon was, but these days the moon is so bright, they have to make up these weird explanations for why it's so bright. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. And his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck, to sift the nations with the sieve of vanity. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. What a beautiful verse, 28. Ye shall have a song, as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, and shall show the lightning down of his arm, with the indignation of his anger, and with the flame of a devouring fire, with scattering and tempest and hailstones. In the end, the earth will be cleansed with fire. It has already been cleansed once with water, and the second cleansing and final cleansing will be with fire. The earth will be cleansed with fire. And Isaiah clearly knew about that. For though, or for through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. And in every place where the grounded staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with tabrets and harps, and in battles of shaking will he fight with it. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. Hope you enjoyed this video. God bless everyone.